Hey everybody, what's going on? It's Alexander Williamson here with Fishery! Exclamation point at the end. That that was what my hand was doing. Anyways, I hope you guys are doing well. I'm sorry I have been gone for two weeks, but uh, unfortunately I lost my cat of uh, a decade or plus that I really loved and uh, that, that really took a toll and had to go visit family while we put him down and everything. And then after that, I was traveling, and I was down in Florida for uh, speaking. So just a side note, if any of y'all watching this, anyone who hears this, would like me to come and speak, and you guys have a club anywhere in the country, if you can get me out there, I'm happy to speak. Uh, so just let me know. You can contact me at my email, Alexander J. Williamson, uh, J as in jet, uh, no spaces or periods or anything, Alexander J. Williamson at gmail.com. Now, the secret history featuring fishery, also on the Aquatic Morning Show. Today's episode is episode 132 that we've returned for, and I'm going to keep it pretty uh, short, and we're going to cover two kind of interesting things going on in the world of aquaria and pets. The first one is that PJAC, which was the group that we've spoken with uh, both on podcast forums, on uh, Aquarium Guys podcast as well is on uh, a few different live streams that we've done and that I've been on panels of as well. Um, they have changed their name from PJAC to PAN, which is the Pet Advocacy Network. And that's because with this whole HR 47, the House bill that went through that tried to come up with a blacklist for all animals and then only whitelist whatever it is that they decided they were going to whitelist, which was never clear. Um, that whole issue really did galvanize the uh, pet hobby. And it wasn't just, uh, you know, parakeets and cockatiels and hamsters and rats and cats and dogs and guinea pigs and bunnies, like the, the top sellers. It was exotic fish, it was saltwater fish, it was freshwater fish, it was rare snakes and, and uh, turtles and all sorts of stuff. And they wanted to kind of more accurately represent that whole group in horses and livestock and things that people keep that are not necessarily just in the traditional sense at kind of the big box pet stores um, available all over. Uh, and make it clear that there is this niche group of us that keep very odd things uh, all over the country. So they've changed their name and their websites are still all the same or redirecting the same right now. But they also have the Pet Advocacy Network. And they also hired a brand new liaison uh, on their team of about eight people that interact as lobbyists in Washington, D.C. So they definitely got some influx of money and hopefully... Uh, this will continue to keep off the threat of this eminent blacklist or expansion of the Lacey Act that was hidden, uh, if you recall, about six months ago, hidden in H.R. 47, uh, which was then going to go to the Senate, and the Senate uh, never voted on it. They never even took it apart and fully uh, analyzed what it is that they wanted to vote on or not vote on, and actually they changed the name of the whole package, and now it's tabled and off I mean, completely off the table, rather, for this session and tabled to maybe discuss some aspects of it, but it sounds like it may be completely gone for this session and maybe even the next in Senate. They just have more issues at hand with the, the inflation and recession and all the things going on politically in the world. So that's one good bit of news, but we need to stay active. So keep posted. I'll tell you guys if I hear anything or anything new comes down the pipeline about trying to ban uh, the ownership of fish, especially those that are endangered or extinct in the wild that we try to care for and uh, and keep alive and maybe even reintroduce like the Goodyear Working Group uh, does. But the last piece of news I wanted to tell you guys is uh, that the uh, Goodyear Working Group, along with a Killifish, uh, American Killifish Association, and some others now, have published that they've actually saved 30 species now. 30 species are in hands of people who 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago in some cases had these fish as pets, 
bred them and kept them in the community before they were even endangered and then they spread them around or kept lions alive long enough that they became endangered they became extinct or they even just got discovered and then they were gone and now they've been reintroduced or that is the only population left and that's pretty cool that it's at 30 fish uh, in just aquaria alone and those are all small little fish this is not counting aquariums and zoos and big organizations that also have uh, projects you know in uh, uh, colleges and universities as well so I thought that was pretty interesting news uh, catch the next episode because we're going to talk about the power behind what made it possible to galvanize not just everybody writing letters and all the pet owners and people like you guys who helped uh, write local congressmen and women and senators and things like that. Um, we're going to talk about the money that is going uh, to be making big changes and that is big box stores and groups like Central Pet, groups like Petco, PetSmart, um, those sort of things in the next episode. So stay tuned. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Alexander Williamson here with Fishery on the Aquatic Morning Show and on my show. And as always, this is going to be an audio based episode. We're going to be talking about something a little different than normal in that we're going to be talking about some economics and some stocks. So today I want to talk about Petco and PetSmart because they do play a big part in what goes on in our hobby. Like it or not, the dollar per gallon sale and all sorts of food and things, for a lot of the country, those are the go-to places for most of us. For me, that's where I get most of my tanks from, unless I'm buying something rimless or special. Uh, you know, I go to the Petco sales usually, PetSmart, same thing. And uh, it seems that lots of pet owners in general do the same, obviously. So. I wanted to talk a little bit about the companies and how over the last quarter uh, Petco didn't perform as well as they had hoped. It only grew, um, so it grew as a company about 5%. However, it lost money as a company to the tune of 5% also, which is kind of interesting. There are far more Petcos, and I'm going to talk about this during a live stream in the future, um, so stay tuned if you're interested in this, but there are far more Petco stores and far less money in each store than PetSmarts. So PetSmarts are less common around the whole country, there being something like 2,400 Petcos and there being something like 800 PetSmarts. Uh, around the country. So they are a little different. One's kind of Costco and the other one's kind of Kroger, Winn-Dixie, Albertson, Safeway, whatever you want to call it, like your neighborhood grocer, um, but not an independent one like your local pet store. So the interesting news is that these groups were pivotal in definitely Central Pet, PetSmart, Petco, um, and a lot of the food companies and things out there were really big on giving money to PJAC, which we mentioned in the last episode has changed its name to the Pet Advocacy Network, uh, so PAN. So they gave money to the tune of millions to PAN. Now, some people had thoughts that maybe it's a conspiracy. Maybe they're trying to just get 200 you know, fish that are their top sellers approved and make the rest illegal, and it would really get rid of that edge that Ma and Pop uh, local pet stars and local fish shops have because you know if they had the corner on the market and the wholesale prices and things uh, it would be tough to beat them if all the other fish were illegal now right now we've dodged that bullet so I want to talk in general terms uh, and assume that's not the case uh, and just talk a little bit about the growth that PetSmart is seeing. So PetSmart stock is trading at like 84 to 85 dollars right now. I think it saw a high of 86 dollars and 70 cents the other day, and it is up. So Pet PetSmart is up, and they are growing as a company. Uh, even investing wise, I can't give investing advice or anything but they've been rated on several websites and several groups that keep track of stock in general, have nothing to do with our hobby, as good buys. And what they've been saying is such a good buy about 
PetSmart is that they've started to bring in these very high-end uh, food brands, whether it's dog food or cat food or wellness uh, toys and like chew toys and things that are made by subcontracted companies essentially. So they're becoming almost a department store of pet goods. So they're looking to bring in also when it comes to things like ZooMed or um, whereas in the past they focused on their own brands, now they kind of have that as a baseline and it's almost like a false leader to tell you here's the cruddy stuff you can buy, then there's the middle of the road stuff that everyone's heard of, you know, Purina and stuff like that, and then there's these new like refrigerated and fresh dog foods and cat foods, maybe even soon to be uh, fish foods as well. Uh, you know, there's frozen ones, but they're talking about doing more of live cultures and things like that that's gotten very popular in Europe, and uh, there's been some talk about it apparently. Now, there have been also moves to push these, and in the last year, 10 of these companies have come into PetSmart and grown. Three have also come into Petco. Now, Petco's stock is trading at around $15 uh, a share, which is pretty darn low. And, uh, you know, if you look back in history, their high was something like $24 about a decade ago. And in the case of PetSmart, they actually are going up, up, up. So they continue to grow, whereas even though PetSmart is expanding with more stores and seemingly also coming out with pretty uh, pretty similar uh, lines of, of food and things in the cat, dog, and uh, small pet section, uh, it seems as though PetSmart is the one making the money. And that company... Uh, posted as a two billion dollar net uh, income company this last year or this last year and uh, because of that uh, then they have to look at their debts and things and they do have uh, a good amount of debt but their their projected growth far outweighs that um, according to all their financers and things and so uh, their growth is up 7.8 percent this quarter alone and uh, they're talking about introducing more things like beta uh, enclosures, maybe higher grade bettas, and uh, sourcing kind of um, what they're calling it is boutique style pets for each section of the, the store. So, I mean, do you think this is a good move? Do you think maybe we're going to see, for instance, people pushing their botanical lines or their, you know, maybe we could get catapa leaves from good organic fair trade type sources um, being featured by a certain breed or you know a certain uh, brand that's already online and they can be incorporated into PetSmart or Petco or do you guys think that that's uh, you know a step in the wrong direction having it all conglomerated into kind of these monopolies of places that tend to have a bad track record track record on actual animal welfare and the quality of care that they receive there uh, you know, I'm a little bit torn. On one hand, I think it's great that places that have no local small independent pet stores uh, can now get access to these things. But with the internet these days, uh, I'm leaning more towards things like uh, Vivi.com, V-I-V-V-Y, who I did some graphic design work for, I must disclose, and who is also affiliated with the same ownership and some of the same uh, people uh, that worked at Aquatic Arts. So that being said, you know, I think there's plenty of great sites like Dan's Fish and uh, The Wet Spot, and uh, you should check them all out. But Vivi's going to be a marketplace uh, that I believe now is open for people to try out. There's still lots of bumps in the road, M doesn't work so hot on mobile yet, but I think maybe that would be a better market personally to see these brands grow, even though they won't get the exposure that they would at a PetSmart or Petco. Um, but I think maybe they could stay more true to their ethics and to the fundamentals that they feel are important. What do you guys think? I'd like to know your opinions, uh, comments below, and uh, your thoughts on what you would like brought in if there were something to be brought into these big box stores. Because clearly caring about the actual animals is kind of... I mean, they like to get away from selling a lot of those animals, quite frankly, because they want to sell you the cages and things. They don't want to sell you 
the actual animals as much because they're a perishable good without that great of a markup in many cases. So, what do you guys think? Which direction do you guys want to see things head? Just kind of interesting to look at the stock market and, uh, you know, the whole capitalist system and how uh, people are voting with their money right now. And it seems like Pets, PetSmart is really coming out ahead um, with their stock in the last uh, year, actually, jumping up from a low of around $62 to now, like I said, up over 80 bucks. So uh, it's interesting to see where this will all land, the growth in a quarter, 7%. Let's see where it's at in a year or two now that the, the pandemic's kind of over uh, for the most part. Um, things are still getting kind of hard to source here and there, but if they made it through that bumpiness with this good of results, um, it's interesting. But it also is a little scary to me because it signifies a share probably of online, independent, Aquabid, wherever, Dan's Fish, um, or uh, your local ma and pa retailers that aren't receiving that money. But at the same time, the whole market grew for pets and for potted plants and things, indoor plants, during the lockdowns and stuff. So um, let's see if it keeps growing. I'm really curious to see if this is true growth and people have gotten into the hobby or if it's a flash in the pan. Yet again, tell me what you think. All right, back to you, Jess. Talk to you guys tomorrow. Hey, everybody. What's going on? It's episode number one. 34 of fishery here on the aquatic morning show or on my channel if you guys are a member for only a buck 99 you get all these plus any of my research and links attached and you get more behind the scenes uh info from all my videos as well so today's episode we have some kind of interesting news and that is that the the episode about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, where I said that I had info that Glow Corridoras were coming to the market. Well, they're here, and uh, the Glow Angelfish are also in the works too, I know. Um, but it turns out that these Glow Cori fish, or, or fluorescently engineered, uh, genetically engineered Corridoras, uh, that they are... Um, something that took a lot of time to figure out apparently. So they used what sounds like the Aeneas, the albino Aeneas Corridoras, and then they used a gene uh, from a jellyfish and a sea cucumber as, as they do, um, and maybe a sponge as well or a coral. Uh, but the first two colors that are coming out are going to be uh, orange and green, and then uh, they also have uh, shown pictures from uh, an expo where there's kind of like a purple toned one. So my guess is that purple will be next to follow. Um, they are a bony scaled fish, so it's kind of interesting that they got them to color up so well. Um, their head is kind of not colored and their body is, which is surprising to me. So maybe they have whatever the scales are made out of keratin or cartilage or actual some sort of, um, you know, bone like material. You know, I actually don't know off the top of my head what they did to engineer these. If, if they're normal, healthy, uh, Corridoras in the sense of all that material, or if it's been altered at all, but in any case, they are now out, and this follows in news of the three new tetras that have come out, which are Pristilla tetras, uh, and they have three varieties of those as well. Uh, I think there's like a, a green and a, a yellowish one, and then a kind of a pink one, um, or purple one. And all of the quarries are going to be $14.99, and I guess they're rolling them out into the shops that sell the most by volume. Now, beyond that, they also have uh, new varieties of the Betta uh, Glow Fish coming out, too. And uh, the Bettas are, you know, they've had the yellowish, or the like kind of yellowish green, and some of them even come out kind of yellowish orangish 
um, males and females. They've had those for a while, and uh, now I guess they're releasing the purple ones too. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, if people keep buying all these and if, if the trend continues, which I don't doubt that it will. Um, I'm just interested, you know, if people are willing to pay that $15 price point, then why not pay that for orange laser quarries or, you know, some something else that's uh, in that range price-wise. Um, maybe it will open up the door to some of those more exotic quarries seeming more affordable whereas now people kind of see them as not because you can go to your local big box store and get Corydoras for you know $3.99 or $4.99 for an Aeneas or a Sturby sometimes uh, the the Similis or the uh, it's usually types of Aeneas the bronze or the emerald or the um, the uh, kind of rusty colored ones uh, those are kind of the ones you usually see for less money the albinos as well and the uh, false um, the false julii or or rather the uh, I believe they're the trilineatus ones so what do you guys think about more glowfish like I said angelfish I know are in the works I wonder what their price point's going to be because they're saying now that they're allowing the bettas to grow out older because they had some complaints about, I guess, the way they were they were growing out and that they were coming out too small, too young when they were hitting the market. So now they're trying to grow out those to a bigger age. So uh, glowfish aren't really my thing in particular. Um, I think some of them, like the Danios, look okay uh, without the black light but I just wonder how that black light is on those fish uh, and their eyes and their foraging and all that um, and I guess it's just something about it it doesn't feel as a relaxed of a tone it feels just more like a, a a toy or something like that to me and you know that's just me I hope plenty of people love these fish and it gets kids into the hobby or whatnot um, but it is, yeah, it's just an interesting development. And uh, the fact that the quarries and all those other fish, they usually enter the U.S. under a drug patent rather than under a species name because of uh, the patents involved and just the way they were created in a lab. Um, it's kind of interesting, too, how the U.S. has dealt with that. But then Europe can't get them at all. And so they're seeing an influx of dyed fish, which is a much crueler practice in my mind, where they take the fish and they inject ink and there can be other issues, trauma, problems, infection. Um, and they usually only do that to kind of the glass catfish or the glass uh, fish of different varieties. The totally translucent fish um, seem to get that the, get the worst of that. So... Um, do you think opening up the trade to Europe would be a good or bad thing? I'd like to hear from y'all. I mean, people want what they want, and I'm sure there are some glowfish in Europe. You know, people will find a way when there's a demand. But yeah, that $15 price point, $14.99 US dollars for quarries, which are also a very social fish, I just really hope that they sell them in groups of like three or five, ideally. Um, that would make me feel a lot better, but I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of lonely ones, and that that is also a bit of a bummer or downside to me, and that's probably just because of the price point, but I hope they educate folks on what these fish need uh, to be happy. That's my main thing. All right, guys, that is the news today. I'll see you tomorrow. Hey, guys, what's going on? Episode 135 of Fish Story. So this is kind of a bright, happy little story. Um, you know, there's a lot of dark stories out right now, unfortunately, about fish dying in heat and droughts and rivers running out of water and chemical dumps going on in um, Germany and uh, Poland on the border there in the Elbe River. I mean, all sorts of uh, bummer stories. But there is a little bright story, and I wanted to keep it positive to end this week. And that is the story of Kira and her 
badass. So she was flying to Tampa, uh, returning to college as a freshman, uh, returning, uh, this will be her sophomore year. And at the beginning of summer, uh, I guess in late May or early June, uh, she was flying with a little pet carrier case with a fish in it, and it was a betta that she had been taking care of, and uh, Kira was not able to bring it with her on the plane. They they blocked her from bringing it, and she had to leave it at the gate. Well, the people were kind enough at the gate who worked for Southwest by the name of Ishmael and uh, his uh, fiance Jamie, and they said, you know what, we will take care of this fish and get it back to you one way or another. So they kept this fish for four months and uh, got it a home. Uh, it, you know, it looks like they got a bowl for it and put it in a bowl and did water changes and kept it alive and healthy enough. And if you do that, um, even though it's not enough stimuli for most of them, uh, but especially for a few months um, and given the circumstances, um, as long as you kept up on the water changes with the dechlorinator and everything, um, keeping them at a warm enough temperature, which in Tampa probably wasn't an issue, uh, you know, it's okay to keep them that way for a little while. Uh, I, I can see already some people probably saying like they were just in a bowl and the story doesn't look like they were doing that great. Whereas she had a little carrier acrylic case for them, like that you'd see crickets or a small hamster or something carried in. And uh, I'm assuming that means that it was going to a tank that is larger, probably. Um, but it has a happy ending in that just the other day, Kira was reunited with her fish and uh, is able to finish her sophomore year, or start her sophomore year, rather, with the fish in hand. And so there's some pictures and stuff and a link to the story uh, on the community tab. Um, you know, I like to give sneak peeks to folks so you guys can see if uh, the the 16 extra episodes a month uh, that I put out generally, if it's something you're interested in. And uh, I wanted to keep it lighthearted, like I said, because we've had enough stories. But I do want to keep it in people's minds that we've had a lot of really tough environmental issues um, with fish. And so when we run into more with people or airlines or shipping... Uh, and all the chaos that's been going on in the last two and a half years now uh, with that and things getting rerouted, lost in the mail and so forth, um, it's really taken a toll on animals. And so it's always good to send things overnight direct. I know it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Um, but really with living things, that's the way you should try to do it. Um, or to check and make sure you can bring the creature with you in a small, small amount of water. If it's a very small fry or some eggs or something, um, that can be done. I know Gary Lang flies with eggs frequently. Um, put them in little vials or whatnot, like film canisters and things like that with a dot of methylene blue on the end of a toothpick. Something like that you can do. Or, you know, ship the fish ahead and... Uh, get them then when you're there or arrange for someone else to get them because it is difficult. I wish they would allow more folks to fly with them. I think it's mostly the 3.5 ounce rule or, or however much it is depending on the, it gets more or less restrictive on some airlines but I think that's the general U.S. rule and then there's other rules for other countries and uh, different forms of flying uh, and different security levels of flying but uh, that's the main issue with flying. So always check ahead is the moral of the story. And also it's cool to see that, you know, there's kind people in the world, of course. Um, but it's always nice to see the story and uh, this gal so happy with her beta and to know that she would put that much time and energy into its care. I'm sure she'll do the research and know um, how to treat it as well over the long haul. All right, guys. Well, I hope you have an awesome weekend, and I'll talk to you next time on Fishery. Bye.